From the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, this is Road to Resilience, a podcast about getting through the hard stuff. I'm John Earl. I am a 39-year-old stage two invasive ductal carcinoma breast cancer survivor. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not really how I typically introduce myself, but I feel like for today's purposes, I think um, it, it is appropriate. A more typical introduction for Sarah Strimmel Bentley would have included former Broadway performer. I did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Catch Me If You Can, Rock of Ages, Big Fish, where I played a mermaid. I love that movie. Um, and then I, my, my swan song was an American in Paris. Sarah's specialty was musicals, which she will defend to the death. I just can't stand musicals. <laughs> They're so stupid. Why are they singing and dancing? And I told you why, John, and I feel very strongly about that. I want you to tell the <laughs> listeners why they're singing and dancing, because I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, no, um, the, the origin of why musicals came to be was because, you know, words were not strong enough to convey emotion. So you're so excited, you're so sad, you're so this, you're so that, that no longer can you speak this, you must sing it to get the emotions out correct like so and then when you can't sing any louder than you're singing you start to dance because then you know the song is just not enough the body must take over so then of course it ends up in this giant 11 o'clock number where you're singing and you're dancing and then you have this whole town towns people come in and they get behind you and then the town has so much emotion and so yeah um you know that's my easiest way to explain why we sing and dance on stage is, is that it's too much to hold the emotion. What happens after dancing? You know, <laughs> you collapse. I have no trouble picturing Sarah on stage. She was funny and cheerful when we spoke. But the past year of Sarah's life has been as much about collapsing as singing. First came the diagnosis, an aggressive breast cancer. Then came a double mastectomy, two rounds back to back of IVF, eight rounds of ACT chemotherapy, 28 rounds of radiation. And just recently, um, I had my final reconstructive surgery uh, where they switched my tissue expanders to implants. Yeah. So on this episode of the podcast, we're looking at how Sarah weathered that storm. As she tells it, she didn't make a decision to be resilient. She made a million decisions, moment to moment, to make joy, to make peace, and to keep getting back up again in different ways. One day you wake up and you're like, I have cancer. And that is like the, the biggest thing to hold on the planet. And then what happens immediately after is a, a, a flurry, more like a hurricane, more like a blizzard, I wanted to say, of, of appointments and of information. And so the white noise happens where you don't really hear anything at all. You definitely don't hear your own voice or you know, your own emotions. Um, and then when I started chemotherapy is the moment where you have a slight amount of spaciousness where you have an event, which is getting the chemo once every two, for me, once every two weeks. And then you know the subsequent, what, 13 days between each round of chemo, I would come out to our house in the middle of the woods on the water and finally have a chance to exhale. And, and that moment was when I had the choice, right? Is to decide to feel scared. And, and I, I, I did feel that way, but decide to like really let myself sink down into why me and the anger and the, this isn't fair. And this was not supposed to happen to me. And, you know, the universe had my back, all the stuff, you know, and, and that was the choice or the choice was to, to look at all the beauty around me, right. When I had the moment. And so that was the way that I was able to find that resilience is saying like, what's happening is happening. You have a choice, you know, it is your choice, whether to make yourself feel worse or better. I interviewed somebody recently who talked about the resilience toolkit and how you kind of cycle through these different techniques that Something works for a little while and then it doesn't work and then you'll try something else. And this can happen hour to hour, day to day, almost minute yeah. to minute. Yeah, I think and then that, that was a tool. And then there was there was a Rage Against the Machine cancer patient at one point where I was like, I'm going to drink a whole bottle of wine. Because, you know, and like you, you, there is, there's different hats and there are different tools. And I think we all have different ways of saying this. Uh, uh, but it's, it, I think truly at the end of the day, the easiest way to say it is you, you allow yourself to feel everything. You give yourself the full scope of human emotion because 
there's nothing like feeling the full scope of human emotion when someone's like, hey, you might die, <laughs> you know, so, so sit with that one for a minute. Where would you sit with that one? Oh, I don't know. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you know, I never, I, I never quite let myself sit with that one. I think, I think when I did, if I, if I was being completely honest with you, I think if I was going to leave a legacy now, like let's say if that was my swan song, you know, and that was my final act the last year that I had, I think I started to think about legacy a little, which is really hard when you're 39 years old, you know, it's like, you know, and I started to think of the legacy that I would want to leave through that experience was exactly how I experienced it. I documented it with joy and with, you know, if that was going to be my last time around here, like I said, I'd, I'd want to go down in a vibrant, big old splashy finale, you know, I wouldn't want to go down in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the sad antagonist <laughs> patter song. If we're, if we're doing musical analogies. You have photographs of yourself doing yoga on the roof and there's the seaside and that's almost where I imagined you kind of sitting with all of this. Mm. You know, I have, um, so in this house that I'm recording with you from right now, I'm sitting up in my yoga studio, which is like my little third floor sanctuary. But each day during treatment, when I was out here, and this is like a healing house, it's like my sanctuary. And I found my lump uh, by itching my armpit on a path on the way to our beach. It's this magical path of like phragmites, which are these tall, big sea grasses and stunning birds and, and, and it opens up right onto the bay. And it's, it's just, it's just like the water just, you know, encompasses you when you get to the end of it. So for me, every day during treatment, I would walk that same path where I found my lump and, and I would watch and feel myself change. You know, I mean, obviously the literal changes, I would walk that path and I had hair and I had boobs and then I'd walk that path and I had temporary expanders and I was 10 pounds lighter and then I would walk that path the next month and I was bald, um, you know, and puffy and I would walk that path the next month. So that's where I would unpack everything, looking at the water. You know, I'm, I'm a water person. I'm like a triple water sign. And so I would go down to my beach and I would, I would sort of just take stock of how I was shifting, not just physically, but take stock of how I was shifting emotionally, you know, and as a woman and, you know, I, I, I look at that girl who found the lump on that path and then towards the end of treatment, the woman that walked down it, you know, um, is a very different human than, than the girl that walked down the path at the very beginning of this experience. What was the biggest difference between the girl and the woman? I think the woman now knows that she's not invincible. The woman now knows that like when you look at when you look at the other side and, and, and you look you quite literally stare your death in the face, it, it becomes this it becomes this like deep knowing and this deep rooted strength of of who you are like in the world. And I mean that in like but such a calmer way. Um it's a much more rooted sense of self I have now knowing seeing that dark and going there and going into like the deepest parts of despair and also knowing like going there with the people around me, going there with my partner, you know, like being in like, you know, love is amazing in all forms and all of the good highs and lows. But, you know, when you're screaming at the top of your lungs through a whole night with your partner, like, you know, rubbing your back and, and going through that war with you, I mean, it's, it's just such a, you get to know yourself, you get to know the people around you, you get to, you just, your, your eyes are far more open because all the bullshit is cut out, right? Like you're not, you're not worried about the stupid stuff, you know, it's really not until I, I think like through struggle and through, I mean, I went to war, you know, I don't know anyone that's gone to war and come back the same person, so. I want to back up just a little bit to joy mining. 
Ah, yes. Tell me about joy mining. Joy mining. It's, it's it, you know, it, it, it all, this is all going to sound like very um, similar, like all these different things. And that's good. I want it to sound similar for you guys because it's, it all comes from the same principle of, of, you know, finding the joy amongst, I'm going to say shit again, amongst the, shit, you know, like finding those little moments of, of amazing magic amongst the teardown, right? Like, so, you know, I felt like everything was being burnt to the ground in February. I was puffier than I've ever been. It was the hardest chemo rounds I'd had. I was like on this bone medication that made me feel like my whole body was on fire. I have never felt like, I mean, they had expanded my temporary breasts to like proportions that felt Pamela Anderson-esque, which was very not me. And I would literally felt like an alien. And, 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 and it was dark and it was winter to that. So, so, and it felt like this thing was never going to end. And, you know, we have roller skates. My husband and I have roller skates that I bought us long before the cancer journey. Um, Cause his old apartment had a lot of space and we used to roller skate around it like a roller skating rink. So, you know, it was Valentine's day and he's like, let's get the roller skates out and let's roller skate. And we cook, we have a cook off every Valentine's day. So we did our Valentine's day cook off in our roller skates, naked in our kitchen. And that's joy mining, right? Like as horrible as I felt and as terrible as it was, is finding those moments of magic and, and joy in your life, like that can supersede all of that, right? Letting yourself go there. Um, and they're everywhere if you just open your eyes, you know, and, and if you are able to, to create that, you know, within yourself. So that's how, that's how you find the joy in the midst of the teardown is, 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 is moments. Like we said, micro moments. It doesn't have to be like a great big thing. You just simply be allowing yourself to sit with yourself and, and like, you know, find one great thing about your physical body when you feel like it's turned against you. You know, it doesn't have to be roller skating naked and cooking. You also had this beautiful practice of sort of daily integration of your experiences and the changes that were happening to your body, to your mind. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, as a yoga teacher and a yogi myself and someone that's been doing it for 20 years or so, you know, the way that I could create also some sort of um, baseline was every day I would come up into this room that I'm sitting in right now and, and John can see, but you guys can't, there's like windows on all three sides and an easel and it's, I've got all my, it's my yoga studio. And as my body was changing, which it was every single day, um, I would come up onto this mat that I'm actually sitting on and uh, in my underwear and I would do my yoga practice. And I was very specific about it being in my underwear because as my chest was changing, the shape of my body, every single part, my skin was dry. I would have, you know, whatever it was, um, facing it and getting close to it and then integrating each change and, and having a moment of gratitude that I could even still move, right? That I was alive, I was breathing, I was moving on my mat um, and allowing that each day, each change to sort of have a moment of gratitude to say like, yeah, but I'm here, you know? Yeah, but I'm here was the tagline. Like, yeah. Or I would do this like every time I'd reach my arms up, which I can't right now. I almost just tried to, and I forgot I had surgery two days ago. <laughs> um, every time I'd reach my arms above my head in my yoga practice, which you do quite a bit, I would just have a little moment and I would look up and say, holy shit, I'm alive, right? I would just lift my eyes up. Um, and that was the way that I could have a daily touch point into myself, right? Because it's so easy to ignore, you know, when things are changing in your body and say, oh, this isn't happening. I'm in denial. You know, you see so many people that, that do divorce their bodies in this because they're mad at them, right? So they're like, I don't, I don't want to live in this body. This body has turned on me. This body is not my friend, you know? So for me coming up here and like, like touching touching the parts that were different and saying like, this is, this is changing. This is, this feels this way. Um, and then taking stock of it 
kept me connected, even on the days where I wanted to, I, I did want to divorce my body and be like, bye, you know? So there were days when you felt that anger? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, you know, I, I had someone ask me in an interview and they're like, well, I don't get it. It just sounds like you just, you know, you just were happy all the time and you just chose that. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I think I did a bad job of explaining <laughs> how I actually was resilient. No, I felt angry. I felt sad. You know, I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would wake James up and I would tap him on the shoulder and I would say, hey, babe, am I going to die? And he would roll over and he'd wake up and he'd say, no, babe, you're not going to die. I'd say, okay, babe, I'd roll back over and go to sleep, you know? Um, so I was scared and I was angry. I was angry that I got a healthy gene and that I had a gene that mutated and that, you know, I lost the lottery. Like, you know, I think the way my husband describes it, he said, you rolled snake eyes. He said, you know, we've, we have guardian angels and he and I, our whole lives have been so lucky. I mean, so lucky. So many amazing things have happened to us and we've had, we've gotten out of some things we shouldn't have too, you know, <laughs> so there's some not smart things we've done, but, but yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I felt anger, but then I didn't let myself be angry, right? So feeling and being are two different things. Like I, 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 if you don't feel all the feelings, then you're in denial. That's just it, you know, but, but feeling them and then saying, all right, cool. I'm mad, but being angry is not going to help this. Being angry is just going to make me feel angry and with cancer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't be an angry cancer person. You still have cancer. You know, I'd much rather, like I say, roller skate naked and have cancer than, than be pissed off and just, you know, you know, dark with cancer. So, you know, you feel it and then you make a choice. What was the best piece of advice that you got along the way? Stay present. Stay absolutely in the moment. And then I transmuted that into saying, don't forecast. I think the actual piece of advice I got was <laughs> don't ask questions, put your head down and get through it. Don't listen to anyone else. Don't let anyone else tell you their experience. That was the piece of advice. I just made it sound nicer. No, like literally I had someone be like, don't read blogs. Don't go on message boards. Don't be in a cancer group. Cancer groups are depressing, you know? And so, and I actually quite loved that because it allowed me to have my own experience because I did Google and I did go on a message board and it's like Yelp, you know, the bad reviews really stick out. And when you're really, when you've had a really bad experience, you're going to like shout it from the mountaintops. And so going through this experience every day, I woke up and I said, okay, how do I feel today? How do I make that better? Right. So how do I feel today physically? How do I make that better? There's drugs for that. Right. Usually I call my oncologist. How do I feel today emotionally? How do I make that better, right? And, and those are the things, like, that's, again, how I grew as a, as a human. Like, you know, it's very different when you wake up and you're not going through cancer and you're like, oh, I feel kind of lonely today. I'm going to call up my friend and, like, go to lunch, you know? But, like, these are a much higher level emotions of, like, okay, I, I woke up and I feel like my cancer is going to come back any moment, you know, how do I, how do I make that better? Right. By meditating and reminding myself that my body, you know, to trust my body or, you know, so, so it was staying very present and not saying this is going to happen. This is definitely going to happen. And it's still how I navigate life after cancer. You know, I mean, you can't, if you're living in fear of your cancer coming back every day is a day lived in fear, just the same way as a day lived in anger is a, is a wasted day. If you ask me. I want to ask you what you would hope somebody takes away from this conversation. If I could be any more clear is that there are, there are some things in life we have no control over. There are some things in life that, that quite literally just happen to us, right? But you always have a choice. You always have a choice whether or not you want to let yourself sink down into the emotions that you're inevitably going to feel if it's a situation you're in that's not great, right? Which is sadness, anger, fear, all of that, you know, or you have a choice to look around you and mind the joy, right? And say, I'm in this situation. 
yeah, like we're here. Let's get through it. Let's figure out a way out of it. And in the meantime, you don't, you don't get this year of your life back. Like God is not going to say, or God, whoever you believe in, right? I, I believe in many different things. They're not going to say on the back end, hey, you get an extra year, Sarah. Sorry about that cancer thing. I'm going to give it back to you later. So you still are living your life this year. This year I got engaged. This year, you know, all these amazing things happened to me during cancer because I opened my eyes to them. So don't waste a day of your life. Don't waste a month, a year, even if you're not where you thought you'd be. So to bring us back to the present, where are you right now in your journey? So I just finished my last big surgery, right? I just finished my last big reconstructive surgery on my breast. And it feels like I am now on the back end of, of survivorship, which is, is a, is living, is living my life. Uh, and, you know, every day, every day I take my little pills in the morning, I'm reminded that, yeah, I had some cancer and we're not going to let this cancer come back. And then every time I take those pills, every time I remind myself of that, I'm going to say, I get to use this day to do some really magical stuff. I get to use this day ahead of me to, to live full out 100% because I know what I've gone through, right? So every time I take that little pill, instead of reminding myself I had cancer, I'm going to remind myself of all the possibilities that lie ahead of me. So um, I'm going to write, I'm writing my book, not going to write, I'm in the middle of writing my book. Um, I just started a nonprofit called A Damn Good Life that um, is going to bring women on a total surrogacy journey who are breast cancer survivors that can't carry their own child, uh, and that also aren't able to afford a surrogate. So that is super exciting. Um, so I'm really throwing myself into continuing advocacy for women who are walking this path after me, who have walked it before me and alongside me. So I'm very passionate about that. Sarah Strimmel Bentley is the creator and founder of Damn Good Yoga. To learn more about her work and advocacy, check out the links in the show notes. Road to Resilience is a production of the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. It's made by me, John Earl, Nikki Cheatham, and Emma Stoneham. Our executive producer is Lucia Lee. From all of us here, as always, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.